Hey everyone, and welcome to the force production uh, mini lecture in your skeletal muscle video series. Um, yeah, to, uh, for this particular lecture, what we're going to cover is a bit more of a macro or uh, practical understanding of how we speak about muscles and muscular contractions, how they produce force, and how, again, we might use that a bit more practically as far as the terminology and approach to our understanding when we're looking at a bit more of a exercise therapy, exercise prescription, uh, or physiology perspective, okay? So first up, we're going to review some terms. We brought this up a little bit in order to discuss uh, muscular contraction uh, when we're first going through it in our sliding filament theory. Uh, lecture, but here's uh, a better look and a uh, better investigation of that. So we'll see when our muscles are at resting, we just call that muscles at resting. Uh, when our muscles are contracting, so they're uh, producing a force, right? We have actin, myosin, cross bridges, uh, trying to cause a uh, contraction or shortening of the muscle, but it's equal to the same amount of force that is being resisted to it. So for example, if um, you go to try to lift uh, a car, right? If uh, maybe it's a strong person competition or something, and you go to lift a car and it doesn't budge anywhere. So you're applying a force, but the resistance that's meeting it uh, isn't allowing you any movement. Therefore, we would call that an isometric contraction. Okay. Now, let's say you successfully uh, manage to lift the vehicle up off the ground, so you're in a bit of a squat position, you stand up, lift the car. What we'll end up seeing is something called a concentric contraction, okay? And that's when the force of the muscles, the contractions, um, again, that actin myosin cross bridging and ratcheting action is greater than the resistance. So you overcome the weight of the car. That would be called concentric. And then eccentric is when you go to set down the vehicle again. Uh, the muscles will get long. There's still some force being applied, but the force of the resistance, so the car, is much heavier than what the muscles are doing at that time, so you slowly lower the vehicle. Okay, so again, isometric, concentric, and eccentric contractions. Now there's um, other types of terms that we'll use to describe the resistance or resistance exercises that we do. Um, and again, it's uh, important to uh, recognize these, but um, potentially, you know, you don't necessarily use these too often when you're in, say, a gym setting. Uh, that being said, it's great to have knowledge about these. So the first uh, type of resistance or resistance exercise we'll cover is called isotonic. And so uh, in this sort of an exercise, the amount of force that the muscles produce, again, uh, let's use a bicep curl, uh, they produce throughout a bicep curl is going to be the same. Now, the way this practically works based off of biomechanics and um, the design of, of machines and stuff is this uh, essentially doesn't happen. There aren't really any machines that allow for true isotonic um, movements. What we tend to see instead is dynamic constant external resistance. So what we're saying is the iso, so no change, uh, a tonic force or tension uh, doesn't, doesn't really happen. We can't generate that same force. But what we can do is create the external resistance to make that constant, um, even though it changes the amount of resistance we feel. So for example, at different points in a range of motion of a bicep curl, there's different points of force uh, due to how close to the body it is or how far away uh, will dictate how much force the muscle will experience. So the dynamic part comes from um, uh, how gravity or biomechanics in our lever system works in regards to the weight, the weight itself or the external resistance is constant. Okay, so free weights, weight machines, they typically are all like this. Okay, iso inertial. So, what we see with iso inertial is the uh, movement um, 
changes in its velocity, but the goal with that is to try to obtain constant resistance throughout the range of motion. Okay, a little wordy, a little confusing. Let's try to get a solid example for isoinertial. So there are these uh, trainers or uh, systems that you can put a bike onto. Okay, now this system is mechanical and the idea is it tries to get you to do the same work the whole time. So you put out the same amount of power the whole time. And the way it does this is depending on how quick you're pedaling, it will add or take away resistance. Let's uh, try to visualize this in your head now while you do this. So if you're pedaling really, really slow and it wants you to do a certain amount of work, it's going to increase the resistance so the amount of work you're doing is the same. But if we add in some, some velocity, so we increase how quick you start pedaling, what will happen is the machine will decrease the resistance on the flywheel and therefore the amount of force you have to put in is less because you're moving quicker. Okay. Again, the goal is to have some sort of constant workload or resistance throughout um, uh, your range of motion, uh, even though your velocity is changing. Okay. Variable resistance. So the goal of variable resistance is to change where you experience the resistance over the range of motion. Now we're going to come back to this when we look at a bit more uh, force uh, velocity curves and um, yeah but we'll, we'll you can kind of already imagine that depending on where you are in a certain range of motion the resistance changes one of the best examples is bands so stretchy bands a lot of people have seen these at home for home workouts in particular and the idea is the more range of motion or the more you stretch the band the greater the resistance okay so the resistance changes over your range of motion ROM is range of motion. And then last but not least, isokinetic resistance uh, in which the velocity of the limb's movement throughout the range of motion, motion is held constant by a device. Again, isokinetic. There are a few uh, companies out there uh, that try to replicate this. However, based off of people's biomechanics, it, they're very tricky. You might see some of these machines in a rehabilitative clinic sometimes. And again, the idea is regardless of that range of motion, it's going to have that same constant um, resistance on it. Now, the, the, there is use for these and you can use them, but um, typically they're only for single muscle groups. So for a leg extension machine or a hamstring curl, you don't typically see a lot of these for compound type lifts, uh, definitely not free weights. Again, you need a machine of some sort to be able to calibrate constant resistance depending on the uh, angle of the movement or how fast you're moving. Okay. So again, these are types of resistance exercises that we can categorize them into. All right. So let's look at important terminology. Now there's uh, in particular three charts or graphs that we're going to explore that relate force and velocity. I've said that a few times and, and we'll, we'll give it a bit more uh, investigation here. So, so we'll look at um, force velocity and the relationship between the two and what that helps uh, illustrate for us our speed strength uh, charts or graphs and our strength curves okay and each of these are going to give us a little insight an important term to know although we won't look at it on a graph necessarily is something called delayed onset muscle soreness okay ultimately what that is is uh, that aches or the pains or soreness in muscles that you might have experienced yourselves at some point in time after working out or exercising it's typically after you haven't uh, been training for a while or if you do a particularly new challenging exercise you'll tend to feel this or uh, work out of some sort and what we'll come to find is it's primarily from eccentric uh, components of our, our workouts okay so again if you remember back to the start of the lecture here eccentric loads are when um, our muscles are lengthening but they're under tension still 
So let's first explore this, and we'll kind of jump back and forth between a few slides here, but let's first explore force velocity curves. Okay, so what that graph illustrates is how at different velocities, our muscles have different capacities to produce force. What do I mean by that? Well, if we see here, we'll start off in the middle, but we have lengthening velocity here and shortening velocity because we're speaking about eccentric and concentric contractions. In concentric means shortening, eccentric is elongating. Um, here we see our force curve, and right in the middle is our isometric, okay? So when we have an isometric contraction, there's no movement. If there's no movement, there's no, uh, um, uh, we wouldn't have any velocity, okay? So that's why we're right, right in the middle there. As we move higher up from the isometric line, we have increasing force, and from that isometric uh, center, anything below that is decreasing force. And what this graph essentially demonstrates to us is that as we get more velocity heading in a lengthening direction, we actually increase in the force velocity capacity of our muscles, okay? As the muscles get shorter, we decrease in the capacity to produce force concentrically, okay? And again, that's with speed. This kind of makes sense if you think about it for a moment uh, as far as how fast you can do a bicep curl, for example. When, if you're holding your elbow perfectly at 90 degrees and you go to very speedily, try to uh, do a bicep contraction, especially if there's some resistance, the higher up you get, or the closer to the shoulder you get in this bicep curl, the less capacity you have to actually contract, therefore you're gonna um, produce less force, okay? And you're gonna have uh, less velocity behind that, right? Because it's uh, decreasing, okay? And again, a little bit opposite at the bottom of uh, a bicep curl, the speed at which you can go to that point uh, can remains to be a bit high, okay? So let's take a look here um, sorry, and just to touch on DOMS with this last chart, the reason it's thought that eccentric contractions are the primary contributor to DOMS or delayed onset muscle soreness is because of this high force production that we find in eccentric contractions, in particular when the muscles are, are at more of a lengthened position, okay? So again, that speed and force we believe causes more tearing of the muscles, which therefore creates more DOMS. It's a bit of an inflammation process that uh, causes uh, muscle soreness, needs time to heal up, okay? Okay, next up, let's take a look at our speed strength curve. So while we're uh, uh, assessing this, this graph, keep in mind that force production at higher velocities and lighter resistances are thought to generate this capacity to have something called speed strength, okay? Whereas if we just train at high volumes, we'll just produce a lot of force, but we don't get that same velocity. Another way of saying all of this before we take a look at this graph is the force we produce with our muscles are trained at that certain speed or certain velocity. Okay, let's look at, at um, graph A. So we see force increasing on the y-axis, velocity increasing as we go in the positive direction uh, for velocity on the x-axis. And we're just gonna look at before training. So we're just gonna look at this blue line here. So this blue line, both on A and B are gonna be the same, okay? So if we undergo a purely heavy strength training regime, what we'll find is that our force production is quite high at slow velocities. So when we're moving at a slower speed, we can produce more force. If we were to undergo a low load, so lower resistance, but increase the velocity at which we're moving that resistance, we'll notice that, well, first of all, after training, our overall force production isn't as high. It's relatively similar to 
uh, how we're, we were before training. But what we'll notice is farther at higher speeds, as we increase the speed at which we conduct a movement, we'll be able to uh, generate more force. Okay, great facts, fun to know. What practically does this have for us, in particular, if we're trying to generate our own training programs, right? Well, if we consider that, ideally, we're going to have a greater amount of force at a lower speed as well as a higher speed. What this information tells us is we need to include both heavy strength training as well as low load high velocity components if we're wanting our athletes or ourselves to be able to produce a greater amount of force throughout a range of velocities okay okay let's jump back here last point is uh, that we're going to cover is our strength curves so what this will cover is the amount of force that can be produced over that range of motion okay, so last time we were talking about how much force can be produced over a range of speed. This is speaking about how much force can be produced over a range of motion, okay? And uh, as I already mentioned, it can, it will. Great, so with the strength curves, what we tend to see is we have about three different forms that this will take. And usually when we're talking about resistance training, they really only focus, uh, or this focuses on the concentric for the shortening range of motion. We'll see that for certain exercises, the amount of force produced will descend and a good exercise for that would be, or a good illustration of an exercise would be hamstring curl. So when the legs fully extended, starts producing the most force to get the weight moving and curls up then biomechanically we have less and less force produced through that the bell shaped uh, a good example of that would be a bicep curl so again a little bit weaker to start with lots of force produced in the middle and then less at the end okay and then last but not least would be like an ascending so the start of the exercise uh, so like a squat sorry so um, or, or bench press. So at the bottom of this lift, uh, we have less force produced, but the more and more we push through, the more and more force we get until all the way at the end of the exercise or the end of the range of motion on that particular exercise, we still have the most force being produced at that point in time. Okay. So how and why, like, how can we explain this? Well, one of the ways we uh, can best explain this is by looking at the length tension relationship. Okay, and we got to zoom back into a micro version or vision or view of our sarcomeres. Okay, all comes back to the sarcomere, right? What we'll see is there's an optimum range of myosin and actin that can overlap with each other. Recall every time that a myosin attaches to actin, and, and pivots or ratchets, that's when we get uh, a force production, right? So if we have an optimum overlap of myosin and actin to get the most cross bridges to occur to create the most force possible, that's where, that's where we're gonna get the most tension or more, most force produced, okay? But keep in mind, if the muscle is too long, so it's overstretched as we can see here on this, uh, right side of the graph or if it's too short maybe we've already maximally contracted the muscle we are gonna see detriments or a lack of optimal length of cross bridges between actin and myosin and therefore not the same amount of force produced so this concept of length tension relationship is really really important as a side note practically one of the reasons why it is found that it is not good to stretch uh, statically so like a hold and stretch before you exercise is exactly because of this it was beginning to be found that if we overstretch and have our muscles at a unoptimal length for firing we can increase um, injury and our performance suffers because our muscles are too long they're, they're not at this optimum length 
to fire and produce forces. Okay, so again, this depending on the biomechanics of the exercise, we'll see different amounts of force produced at different points in time for different exercises. Now, if we get to the end of a repetition for a particular exercise, such as a bicep curl or um, a hamstring curl, we'll note that at least somewhere within that range of motion we're hitting our uh, maximum amount of force production. But if we look at this concentric range of motion for something like a squat or a bench press, and at the very top at the end we're still producing our maximum amount of force, um, how do we challenge that? How do we ensure that even when we're producing the most amount of force, how are we getting some strength built there? Well, this is where you'll see some instances of things like chains or resistance bands being used. So at the top end of an exercise, that's when you're gonna have more resistance added onto it, either through tension of a band or through the addition of carrying more chains. So you'll notice here at the bottom of this squat, the chains are resting on the ground so there's less weight or less resistance. As the individual stands up, there's more. So let's try to take a quick peek at that one more time here. So again, someone squats down, the chains rest on the floor, there's less weight. But as they extend and they're able to produce more force or more, uh, yeah, more force through their squat, it picks up more chains and therefore makes the resistance greater. Okay. So we'll return finally one last little uh, graph to investigate our force time curve. And this all comes back to that, that prior point where we're trying to talk about velocity and force production. This is looking at a very similar thing. So over the amount of time, um, ultimately what we're trying to do in sport often is produce power. Okay, so power is a large amount of force over a distance divided by time. Okay, so how much work can be done? How much power can be put out at a rate of work for a unit of time? Okay, a different way of saying that is how much force over time can we produce? And how quick can that happen? So we'll notice here, again, we have our untrained in red for a baseline comparison. And we have our heavy strength training only. So again, that's heavy weights. Uh, generally, we find a larger force production uh, more slowly. And our explosive and uh, power training. So something with speed added into that strength training. So what do we see? Well, for our individuals that do a combination, we see that we hit a greater amount of force sooner and more rapidly uh, and a larger amount of force production than we see with just the heavy strength trained individuals. Ultimately, they'll be able to produce a little bit more force, but at a much slower rate. And again, when we're talking about high performance sports or even some activities of daily living, such as catching ourselves if we're gonna fall or any quick movements where we need a lot of force, um, including or integrating some sort of explosive strength training, into some uh, exercise programming is ideal. Okay, so that's uh, a little bit of look uh, and, and assessment at uh, how do we speak to uh, different force production, uh, velocity, time, strength, some of these new terms, and how does that look when we're starting to think about training programs.